Great to see everyone here this morning. Uh, that little video you watched there is a, of a song called Reckless Love by Corey Asbury. Um, the reason I showed that is, you know, for about the last month or so, I've been showing a little promo video of a different life group we have. And uh, so I showed that one because Thursday night is the start of one of our life groups. Uh, this meeting at the home of Ben and Trish Kerwood. Uh, they're going to look at the songs we sing. You know, if you think about the songs we sing, we make a lot of, like, bold declarations to God. You know, like, earlier we were singing, like, uh, you know, I, I, I will kiss your feet, like, surrendering to Jesus everything. That's a bold claim to make. Uh, that song, you know, the idea of reckless love. Uh, reckless can sound uh, bad. It, it can almost make it sound like uh, we're accusing God of doing something inappropriate or doing something wrong, uh, and, and, but his love for us is so extreme and so overflowing and so reckless in the way that we would view things a lot of times. So uh, they're going to look at a lot of those songs that we sing and, and hopefully kind of expand uh, people's uh, you know, uh, capacity to worship. So that's Thursday nights. would encourage you to check all of those life groups out. We have some uh, really cool stuff going on, quite a variety going on there. Uh, we'd like to welcome you today uh, for the third week of our series called Weird, because normal is not working. If you missed the last couple weeks, I'm just going to give you a, a quick recap here. The first week we talked about Jesus' teaching. We talked about the, the wide road, the broad road, and, and how there's a lot of people on that, right? And the bad news is that road leads to death, it leads to destruction, it leads to bad things, all right? Um, then he talked about the narrow road, right? And the narrow road um, is, is uh, it's, it's a little bit harder, right? It's a little more challenging, so there's not as many people on it. And, and, and so the good news is, though, that that's the road that leads to life. Um, and then last week we talked about how many people, maybe you yourself, hopefully you yourself, at one point were probably living on the wide road and decided, you know what, I'm going to go, I'm going to live my life on the narrow road, I'm going to follow Jesus, I'm going to look for his will in my life. So you leave the wide road and you get on the narrow road and then people call you weird and they want to pull you back on to the normal road. Um, but we don't care. We don't want to be normal because in 2019, normal is broke. Normal is addiction. Normal is overwhelmed. Normal is spiritually bankrupt, financially bankrupt. Normal is divorce. Normal is estranged relationships with your children uh, or parents. We don't want to have anything to do with normal because normal is not working. But when led by the Spirit of God, weird is so much better than normal. So I'm going to talk to you today about weird desires. Weird desires. Because it's so normal to give into our natural desires, our impulsive desires. So I don't know about you, but how many of you have ever felt like saying something, even though you know you shouldn't say it, and you went ahead and said it, and then later on you regretted it. Yeah, Robbie's hand shot right up. I think maybe, maybe Robbie and Stephanie had a rough car ride here this morning. I don't know, you know. Uh, or maybe it was an email or a text or uh, a reply to something on social media. A lot of people have done or said something that they almost immediately regretted, but they gave into it. Uh, that's why it's pretty common for people today to live with this idea of no regrets, right? And so it's so common. People have started getting tattoos of it. Uh, okay, let's, let's show that first one here. Uh, yeah, this lady has no regrets about her tattoo, right? Uh, you know, so I saw that one. I saw this next one, which I thought was kind of fun, too. Uh, no regrets, all right? I don't know what that is. I think it's one of those communicable de diseases I've been hearing about. Uh, do we have any essential oils for regrets? Okay, like, I, I hope there's something to stop that, because I don't want no regrets, all right? Um, this next one's kind of fun because this guy wants to regret nothing, so he put regret in Chinese. He clearly wanted it written in Chinese, but he didn't specify. That is a regret. You're right, buddy. And so I, I show these. I have, I have nothing against tattoos. I, I have a tattoo of my own. And, and sometimes when you're awesome and you know you're awesome, you just got to tell people you're awesome, right? So here we go, right? Uh, <laughs> Uh, he's awesome. Not at looking up words in the dictionary to make sure he's spelling it right, but he is awesome. Uh, Ken, thanks for letting me get a picture of your back for this this morning. Uh, <laughs> um, I think we could all say at some point or another, we've all done something uh, that we've later regretted. 
and that's normal. It's normal to give in to our natural desires. That's what normal people do. They do it all the time. And that's why if you're taking notes um, or, or if you get one thing from these five weeks, uh, this is what I want you to get. If you want what normal people have, do what normal people do. We've talked about it. Normal is not good. Normal is broke. It's overwhelmed. It's addiction. It's divorce, right? So if you want that, just do what those people are doing. But on the other hand, if you want something different, you have to do something different. We have to be willing to be weird. It's time to be different. And, and a lot of that's going to start with our desires, not giving in to those lower, earthly, natural desires. Uh, it's kind of interesting, all throughout the Bible, you can see this, and it's, it's displayed in really the first time there's human interaction in the Bible, all right? People giving in to these natural desires with the story of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, uh, you know, they're, they're in the garden, and God says, hey, you can eat anything you want. Anything you want here except for from that one tree. Don't eat the fruit from that tree. Everything else, fair game, have at it. And what do they do? They eat from that one tree, right? They're tricked into it. They give into those desires. If we fast forward a little bit, we look at the life of Moses. He gets upset about the way the Egyptians are treating his people, and so he goes out and he takes revenge, and very impulsive, giving into his natural desires, and, and, and he gives into that, and he kills an Egyptian, who then has to flee. Think about King David. King David sees Bathsheba bathing on a rooftop, another man's wife, and he says, I want some of that action. Bring her over here. She's mine now. He gives into his earthly, normal, natural desires. And that's what normal people do. So I don't know what it is for you. Maybe you get angry and you explode. And you let out a barrage of, of cuss words uh, left and right like crazy. Maybe, maybe uh, you eat and you eat and you eat and you eat. Maybe it's sexual desires that you give in to all the time. Maybe you're the only good driver in Knox County and you have the desire to tell other people off all the time. You know, I, I don't know what it is. Uh, but we all have something that normal people do that we're lumped right there with them. The Bible talks about this subject. So if you have your Bible, uh, turn to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. Uh, we're going to look at verses 16 and 17. Sometimes it's so cool in Scripture. Uh, like if, if you've preached or if you've taught, uh, sometimes you open a Scripture up and you'll be like, man, there's my three-point sermon, like right there, right in front of me. And we see that here in this, th these two verses, right? It lists three different normal desires. Um, King James calls it the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Here's how the NLT says it. <clears throat> it says, for the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, or the lust of the flesh, right? I want to have fun. It feels good, so I'm going to do it. I want to enjoy my life. I want to live my life. All right, so the, wor the world offers uh, a craving for physical pleasure. It offers a craving for everything we see. All right, wow, I don't have that. Or, you know, it's the iPhone 12 R2. You know, I got to have that. I don't have one of those. I want one of those. I need that to make me happy. Uh, and, and so that's the, the, the craving for everything we see. And then the third one here is a pride in our achievements and our possessions, right? Uh, you know, wow, I want people to think I'm important. I want people to know what I did. And so right there, I look at that, and I'm like, man, that's an awesome three-point sermon. And so you know what I did? I went a, a different direction. I'm not going to use it that way, okay, because I'm weird, all right? So I just wanted to point that out to you. Sometimes that's how it works, right? Uh, we can fall into these traps, but here's the thing, right? So there's these three things, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Scripture goes on to tell us that these are not from the Father, but they are from this world. <clears throat> they are from this world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. The good news is, Scripture says that anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. But, but we see it all the time. Normal people giving in to what their natural desires are. And so they follow their own appetite and their own craving. And what I want to do, as I told you, I'm not going to use that for my outline. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at what normal people do, 
with their desires. We're going to look at what weird people do with their desires. And we're going to compare and contrast. So you're going to get a good picture of two types of people. And then at the end, we'll put it together and we'll see where we stand. <clears throat> so we'll start with this thought about normal people. If you're taking notes, we'll start with this right here. Normal people want what they want now, not later. They want what they want now, not later. I, you know what? I get distracted very easily. And you guys know that, okay? Uh, because you've seen it happen up here in front of 300 people. I, I, got, I got distracted this week as I was working on this. And I was thinking about this. And I thought of this commercial called J.G. Wentworth. It's my money, and I want it now. You know, and then someone else pops their head out of a car like, it's my money, and I want it now. You know, I probably watched that five times this week. All right, so, uh, but, but that's kind of the world we live in, right? It's instant gratification. We want what we want, and we want it now. Um, here's the really cool thing. As I've told you before, I don't get into generation bashing. Yeah, we live in an instant gratification generation now. Uh, but that's not necessarily new. It just looks different now, right? It, it just looks different, okay? This has been around. This idea, this concept, this problem has been around. If you have your Bible, look at Luke 15, 12. If you don't, you can look here on the screen, all right? Jesus tells this story about a father with two sons, right? And the younger son comes up to him and says, I want my share of, my, uh, of the estate. I want my share of your estate now. I want it now before you die. So we see this all the time today. This was uh, a problem back when Jesus was walking the earth. So he's talking about it. This is what normal people do. They give in to their desires. I want what I want, and I want it when? I want it now. I want it now. You know, and it can look a lot of different ways. It could be, you know, a, a, a boy and a girl snuggling and, and cuddling. It's the type of snuggling and cuddling that the Bible says is only for married couples, right? Uh, but they're like, hey, I want it, and I want it now. You know, it could be someone who's mad at their boss, their boss hurt them, overlooked them, stepped on their toes, or, you know, got them in trouble for something, so they, they get really upset, and they want to tell their boss off, and so they pound out this email, and they hit send, because they're all fired up. And then they walk in the next day, and they realize they're just fired. You know, like, that, that's all you are the next day. But they got what they wanted then, right? In that moment, they gave in to their lower natural desires. So, that's the first thought. The second thought here, uh, I'm going to give credit to Andy Stanley. Uh, he, he teaches a leadership podcast where he uses uh, this, this idea, this concept, and it was just so powerful to me. Uh, it was a great message. I, I wanted to use it. So normal people, first of all, uh, they want what they want now. Here's the second thing. Uh, if you're taking notes, normal people will often trade the best for the immediate. They have something of extreme value, extreme importance. They have something that is better, but they'll trade it for something that's more immediate. They'll trade the greatness of the future for the immediacy of now. There's a story that illustrates this really, really powerfully in the Bible. It's a story about two brothers, Jacob and Esau. Uh, and, and if you know a little bit about their story, uh, Esau was the older brother, and, and he was kind of a, a man's man. You know, like, I, I always pictured him like, he had like a big old grizzly beard. He probably wore a lot of flannel and had to walk like this because his, his, he, he was just jacked, you know, like probably a real deep voice, uh, you know, just a, just a man's man, right? So that's Esau, right? And then you got, you got Jacob, the younger brother. He's the one that was always getting sinus infections and, you know, always had a lot of acne and, you know, real nasally voice. And, you know, that post-nasal drip was rough on him, right? He's kind of a whiner. Kind of a mama's boy, uh, you know, and, and, and so <laughs> obviously that's my interpretation. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, in biblical times, the oldest son uh, would have what was known as the birthright, right? So if you were the oldest son, you basically had a tremendous advantage. When the father would die, the oldest son or whoever had the birthright would get a double portion of the inheritance, all right? So that father would die, the son would rise into a position of power, kind of like the executor of an estate or the, the judge of the family. And so Esau had this because he was the oldest born. He had this. Um, and Jacob, the, the younger brother, was jealous. So one day when Esau was out, maybe on a hunting trip or wrestling a grizzly bear or, you know, doing something, I don't know, 
He came home hungry, and that mama's boy, Jacob, is in there wiping his nose and, you know, trying to keep a snot in his face, and uh, he's in the kitchen making some stew. Jacob goes on to trick his older brother into giving him his birthright. Here's a story from Genesis 25, starting in verse 29. Uh, The Bible says, One day when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau arrived home from the wilderness, exhausted and hungry. Esau said to Jacob, I'm starved. Give me some of that red stew. All right, verse 31. All right, Jacob replied, but trade me your rights as the firstborn son. Esau, the older brother, he says, look, I'm dying of starvation. What good is my birthright to me now? Let's pause for a moment there. Do you really think he was about to die? No, no. I think he probably could have lived off his beard oil for a little bit. You know, like he was probably going to be okay for 30 minutes where he can make something. But in this moment, he feels like he's about to die. Look, I get it, okay? I get a little fussy when I'm hungry. I'm not me when I'm hungry. Uh, I can get a little whiny and dramatic after I've been out wrestling grizzly bears and coming back in. I want to eat too, all right? But he's a little dramatic here. I'm, I, I'm, I'm about to die. I'm starving. I'm dying of starvation. And then he asks this question that seems so stupid, right? Let's, let's just call it what it is. It seems like a really stupid question. Esau says, what good is my birthright to me now? I'm so hungry. I've got this need, and I really desire that bowl of stew that you have. So what good is that birthright to me? But I can get that bowl of stew now. So Esau, the older brother, does something that I think we could all agree is so foolish. So foolish. And and we think, how in the world could anyone be so stupid, so foolish, so short-sighted, so narrow-minded. Because what he did was he traded his birthright, the ultimate, the best, this thing of extreme value, he traded that for the immediate want he had for a bowl of stew. And so what do we do? We look at that thousands of years later, and we're like, oh, Who would be so foolish to trade their birthright for a bowl of stew? I would never do something like that. The reality is, we do that all the time. Normal people do it every day. Every single day. People are stupid enough to trade the ultimate, the most important, the best, for the immediate. Because of distorted desires. And I can promise you, every single one of you knows someone who derailed their life because they had a desire that went unchecked, that went unmanaged, and it led them to doing something stupid in the immediate because they forgot about the ultimate. They forgot about the big picture, right? What happened is they locked in in that moment of desire, and they forgot about everything else in their life that mattered. Because at that moment, that bowl of stew was the most important thing to them. And normal people do that all the time. Right? It, it could be, you know, a young girl going out shopping and, you know, these clothes that I get, oh, they make, they make me so happy. And so she has to buy a matching belt to go with her matching hair clip that she bought to go with her matching socks that no one can see because of her, like, $85 jeans, you know, that uh, she couldn't afford. And so she took out credit cards to get. Pretty soon she wakes up and she's $30,000 in consumer debt and she has no idea how she got there. I can tell you how she did it. One bowl of stew at a time. It could be the man who really loves his wife, loves his children, loves his God. But in the moment when he's looking on his computer and he's one click away from something lustful, that in that moment might feed his lustful desires. And in that moment, he focuses on the stew instead of the promises he has, instead of the love he has for his bride, instead of the love he has for his children, instead of the love that he has for his God. And so in that moment, he trades the ultimate for the immediate. I can tell you how he wrecked his marriage. I can tell you how he pushed his kids away. He did it one bowl of stew at a time. Could be the young girl who really wants a godly husband. She really wants to be loved 
and, to, and she wants to, to, to love someone. She wants to feel love and, and, and to give love. And so she meets a guy, and he's a pretty good guy. Pretty soon, he starts pressuring her. He starts pressuring and saying, well, if you really love me, you would do this. And you would do that. Things that she knows she's not supposed to do. She wants to live her life to please God. But ultimately, she trades the ultimate for the immediate. It happens all the time. Normal people do it all the time. Men, they say they really love their families. They want to be a good dad. I, I, I want to love my kids by being the best provider possible. And so oftentimes what happens is they go after the pride of life, the accomplishments of life. It's like, well, I want to give them more than I had. I want to give them so much. And so they work and work and work to rise up in the corporate ladder so they can get a bigger house, bigger cars, bigger boats. And then one day they wake up and their kids are 24, 27, 29, and they realize they don't even know their kids. They can't even speak into their life. They don't have relationships with them. And they realize, how could I have been so narrow-minded? I traded the ultimate for the immediate. I traded relationships for selfish accomplishments. I pursued that bowl of stew my entire life. So who would be so dumb to trade their birthright for a bowl of stew? <laughs> the answer is normal people do it every day. And so this is what I want to ask you. This is why this has been on the, on the screen. I want you to be honest enough, truthful with yourself. Between you and God, you're not fooling yourself and, and you're not fooling God. So search your heart. What is your bowl of stew? What is your bowl of stew? What desire do you have that if left unchecked and unmanaged could really short-circuit the life that God wants you to live? What's going to take you off the path? What's going to blow your life up? And it could be something as simple as a bowl of stew. I mean, we read about it in Scripture with Esau. I don't know what it is, and, I, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to, like, pick on things, but I, I, I've seen People that have addictions, right? Like, like they know these cigarettes are taking years off their life. But they're pursuing the immediate instead of time with their grandkids. It could be control, for crying out loud. I work at a church, okay? You know, like, I know about people that struggle with control. It could be that. They're pushing everyone away. Their spouse, their kids, people they work with, people they go to church with because they have the immediate need to control everything. And so they're sacrificing the ultimate for the immediate. I've worked with kids my entire adult life. It could be popularity, right? You spend so much time with these students, pouring into them, trying to train them to make these right decisions, to make their faith their own, and to live following God. But kids also want to be accepted. Adults want to be accepted. And so they trade the ultimate for the immediate, for friends that they may not even know two years later. So what's your bowl of stew? I think we all have one. I think we all have one thing, if we're honest with ourselves, that can kind of pop into our head, that if left unchecked, if left unmanaged, can lead us off of that path just like it did with Esau. So normal people... They want what they want now, not later. And then this one. They're willing to trade the best for the immediate. Okay, so that was our normal people. So now we're going to work on our weird people. So we can compare and contrast. All right, two different values, two different things here. Weird people, first of all, this one's going to seem really obvious. If you're, if you're taking notes, you remember the first one. Weird people know that later is often better than now. Right? Later is often better than now. Uh, Proverbs 16.32 says that it's better to be patient than powerful. Better to have self-control than to conquer a city. So in, in other words, God may say, hey, it's, it's not all bad that you have that bowl of stew. De depending on, on what it is, uh, maybe you're allowed to have it, but not right now. Like, wait a little bit. G get it later. Not right now. W weird people know that later is often better than now. 
And, and so here's what I love about weird people. Here's what I love about you weird people, okay? Because I think we have a church full of weird people, and I mean that in the most loving way possible, okay? Hopefully you've paid attention to everything I've said, not just that part. Um, is, is weird people are willing to give up something they want for something they want more. You know, a lot, of, a lot of life can be boiled down into that, right? Being willing to trade up something you want for something you want even more later on. We live in a society that is not wired that way. Uh, I, I, I'm a proud Amazon Prime member, all right? Been there for like five years now. It has changed our life, okay? I love Amazon Prime. Uh, but I'll be honest, that two-day shipping, sometimes that'll get you, right? It's like, hey, I put this order in Saturday at, at 10.30 p.m. That better be here Monday or I want a full refund on my Prime membership, right? Like, we want what we want. We want it now. Think about Netflix or Hulu. You know, you finish an episode and it counts down from 10. Your next episode will begin and I have to wait 10 seconds? Oh, I want to watch it right now. This episode of The Office I've seen 52 times. Give it to me now. Like, I want to watch it. Now, I read something about a guy who was talking about Pop-Tarts. You know, that super nutritious, healthy breakfast food, right? Uh, just get your, get your day started right with a nice shot of sugar right to your forehead. Okay, so um, <laughs> Pop-Tarts. And he was talking about, well, I don't have time to use the toaster. I'm too busy. I'm too important. I don't have time to use the toaster. So I use the microwave. It's like, dude, you don't have time to use a toaster. Come on, man. Like, but that's the world we live in, right? I can't take the 60 seconds to, to do the, the pop tart the right way. I have to use the microwave in 15 seconds. We live in a world that is so focused on now, right? We want it now. One of my favorite shows, um, Par uh, Parks and Rec, this, this guy says, but it's America. I want it now. You know, we've been trained that way. We want everything right now. There is power in waiting. There is power in God's timing. There is power in trading the immediate for the best. See, it works both ways, doesn't it? I saw this really cool video where they take a, a kid and they put him in a room and, and they sit him at a table and in front of that table they put a paper plate and they put a marshmallow right, on, right, on, on, right in front of him. And they'll tell the kid, like, hey, you can have this marshmallow. But I got to go run like two errands. I'll be back in about five minutes. If you don't eat this marshmallow while I'm gone, I'll bring you two more. Right? So if you wait, if you wait five minutes, you can have three marshmallows. Or you can eat the one that's right in front of you right now. So they, the adult walks out of the room, and they have cameras on the kid. And, you know, you see them, and they're looking at it. They're like, you know, like, you know, then they'll, they'll like pick it up and, smell it, oh, okay, you know, they'll put it down for a second, you know, some of the kids, the weird kids, right, they'll pick it up, and they'll, like, lick it, <laughs> lick it, and then put it back down, and, like, step away, like, uh, okay, it's still there, and just about every kid, you know what they did? They ate the marshmallow, right? They could have waited and had three marshmallows, <clears throat> but in that moment, they wanted what they wanted now, right? We need to learn as adults and to teach our kids, it is so much better to wait. This applies to so many different areas of life. I think about financially. Normal is broke. Normal is debt on debt on debt. Okay, And you know what that usually tells me, debt on debt on debt, is that someone can't wait. Right? Pay something down. Pay something off. Get a bigger down payment. Buy something with cash. Right? Like when it comes to our finances, a lot of times... Waiting is going to be better, or later is going to be better. Uh, let's take sex, right? What does the world say? The world says sex is good. Go and get it, baby. Go and get it anywhere you can, any way you can, right? Weird people wait because they know God's plan is better, and his plan is waiting. God says it's le it, 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 that, that later is better than now. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing now, uh, if you're taking notes, and, and I think this one gets really important for us, okay, this is where some real spiritual transformation can happen, uh, is weird people, they seek God until his desires become our desires, all right? If we want to be weird, we seek God until his desires become our desires. 
Psalm 37, 4. The Bible says we are to do what? Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desires. This verse is really interesting because a lot of people will look at this and they'll say, man, God's going to give me my heart's desires. Well, I want an invisible helicopter. You know, like, that would be so cool, right? That first part is really important to this verse. Take delight in the Lord. Take delight in the Lord. See, what it's talking about is not like, oh, we delight in the Lord, now you get an invisible helicopter. No, it's about changing us. It's about changing our desires. If you're using a paper Bible, or if you're taking notes, circle the word that says delight, or in your Bible, beside it, write the word anag, A-N-A-G, okay? That's the Hebrew for delight, and here's what it means. It means to be soft. It means to be happy about. It means to be pliable. You know, the to be happy about part of that makes sense, doesn't it? When we consider that it means delight. That's how we translated it. In almost all of our Bibles, it says the word delight, okay? And it would be traced back to this root word. So to be happy about makes sense. But what about the first two? When we think of delight, we don't always think about being soft or being pliable. So I want to give you a little image for this, a little idea for this. What this means is as you're seeking Christ, as you're seeking God's will for your life, you will be made soft. You will be made pliable, right? Imagine that God is the potter, we're the clay. As we seek him, we're being, he's pouring water on us, and it's kind of like, oh, okay, like this is changing me. I'm becoming more pliable and more pliable and more pliable. The more we seek God, the more pliable we become. And then we will be able to delight in what the Lord delights in. What breaks his heart is going to break our heart. What motivates God is going to motivate us. That's what happens when we seek God, is we become more pliable. But I'm telling you, right now, a lot of people seek nothing in their life except for that next bowl of stew. I think we got to call it what it is. It's a bowl of stew. It's meaningless. It's temporary. Instead, we need to seek God. Open up his word and become passionate about him. Passionate about what he's passionate about. And and as we do that, we're going to notice that more and more our heart is being molded and he is giving us his desires. His desires become our desires because we desire what he desires. Figure that one out, right? (laughs) His desires become our desires because we desire what he desires. He will give us the desires of our heart because we will no longer desire the things of this world because we're being changed. All right? Here's my way of saying it. We become weird, okay? We become weird. We become different. We're not living for what everyone else lives for. We're not on the normal road, right? Our aiming point's not the same. Our focus is not the same. I love what Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 and 17 say about this. Paul's writing, and he says, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. If we do that, you guys know we're going to be weird, right? If you let the Holy Spirit guide your life, you're going to be weird, right? So he says, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. What all the other normal people are doing. He says, A sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit, what does it do? It gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you're not free to carry carry out your own good intentions. I think this is really powerful. When we leave the normal road, the broad road, and we get on that narrow path that leads to life, it's not you changing. It's you being willing to change. It's not me changing you. It's not Lyle. It's not Ken. It's not the elders. It's not that book you read. It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit changes your heart. And all of a sudden, rather than wanting the things of this world, rather rather than wanting more empty things that don't last, right? The lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Instead, our life starts to revolve more and more and more around glorifying God. And as you do that, you'll start desiring to become more generous. 
You'll start desiring to forgive people. You'll start desiring to show grace. You'll start desiring to go the extra mile, to worship God completely, not just in song, but in life. And you'll do all these things that normal people don't do because God is changing you. Here's the problem with this. As you grow closer to God, I can promise you that Satan is going to continue to offer you more and more (laughs) stupid bowls of stew. And if you're not prepared for it, you may compromise all of the blessings that God has mapped out for you. All those things that God wants to use you to accomplish something great for the kingdom of heaven. You may be willing to trade for something temporary, for something meaningless. That's exactly what Esau did. We're going to have our praise team come up, and I I want you to think about this for a moment here. For decades, for centuries, we as Christians, we have read, we have heard, uh, and we have said that we serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Right? We, We see it all through Scripture. We serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Who was Jacob? Jacob was a younger brother. Right? It shouldn't have been him. Who should it have been? Esau. Should have been Esau. It could have been him if he wasn't so short-sighted and willing to trade his birthright for a bowl of stew. If in that moment he had done what was right, we would say to this day, we serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. But because of unchecked desires, because of what he wanted in that moment, Esau traded the ultimate for a bowl of stew. And we think, who would do that? Normal people do it every day. And that's why Central Christian Church, we are not going to be normal. We are going to follow Jesus. We are going to seek him. We are going to live our lives to please him. And yeah, sorry, we're going to be weird, okay? But we don't care what anybody thinks because we know that weird is so much better than normal. Let's pray. Father, uh, this morning I, I pray for anyone here who is uh, pursuing a bowl of stew instead of you. Uh, Father, I pray that for people who have temptations, have these things going on, uh, I pray that your spirit would, would be there, would, would encourage them, would challenge them, would convict them, whatever it is, to leave that temptation and to pursue you. Lord, we thank you that we don't have to do it on our own. That's that's such an encouraging thing to think that I don't have to just try harder. I don't just have to try to be better, but that I have the promise of your Holy Spirit to change me if I'm willing. And Lord, for anyone here this morning who's not made a decision, we ask for your spirit to be incredibly active. We ask for for your spirit to to convict, to encourage, to challenge anyone who's ready to take that first step, take that next step towards living for you. Lord, if that person's here today, uh, please be with them. We thank you that you have given us so much and that we have uh, so much hope and we have so much promise because of your love for us and because of your son, Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. If you have a decision to make, if you're ready to leave your old life behind and pursue Christ, you can come forward. We'll talk about repentance. We'll talk about confession. We can talk about baptism and figure out where you're at, what your next step is. I want to challenge you if that's where you're at, I'll be down front. Ken will be down front. Uh, Come and meet us. We're all going to stand and let's, let's give it all to God.